So good morning. Um, my name is Jamie Royce Gomes, and I am the manager of Living with Fire program. Welcome to the Living with Fire virtual series. This is session six, Wildfire Smoke and Health. And so we, this is going to be co-hosted with Amanda Milici. Amanda, would you mind introducing yourself? Oh, I think you're muted. And Always on mute. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Amanda. I'm with the Tahoe Network of Fire Adapted Communities and Tahoe Resource Conservation District. And super happy to be here. And shout out to Living with Fire for um, making these awesome presentations. Hey, we're doing it together, Amanda. This isn't yeah. just us. So um, Amanda here is, is going to be um, representing the uh, Lake Tahoe Basin. If you have any questions that's related to Lake Tahoe and Amanda can answer it, she's here. Um, I am going to get started. Um, we, we're going to be going over some agenda items. Um, we, and um, we're going to do uh, some housekeeping. And then we're going to do a pre-workshop poll. Um, and then I'm going to introduce you to the speakers. Then after the speakers, we are going to do a post-workshop poll. And then we will do um, the Q&A period. And so hey, hey, this... Jamie, did... Oh, never mind. I, I noticed the waiting room still had a bunch of people in it, so it looks like those are being I just now. let everybody okay. in. I think maybe people weren't in yet. Oh, okay. Um, if, for, for those of you that just entered in, um, my name is Jamie Royce Gomes, manager of the Living with Fire program. Um, so for the agenda, we are going to be um, talking about um, some housekeeping items, then we're going to do pre-workshop polls, um, then I'm going to introduce you to the speakers, and then we will do post-workshop polls, and then the Q&A session. So this right here is the screen that you see. Um, we are asking that folks please mute. Um, if you notice that you're unmuted and then you have been muted, um, it's just us as hosts. We are asking that all attendees please turn off your video. Um, we do have a speaker with some videos, so it's going to help with bandwidth if we have videos off. Right here is the chat button. Um, this is where you're going to be asking your questions. So when you click on the chat button, then you're going to see a drop down menu and then you're going to click on questions for speakers. And this is where you're going to type in your questions. Um, we are asking that folks, please ask your questions to the questions for speakers. Um, as hosts, it's sometimes difficult to um, do, do the, the webinar and answer questions. Um, so please direct your questions to the questions for speakers. Then the person behind that, that's Christina Rossano, she will end up sending me the questions. And during the Q&A period, I will ask those questions and the speakers will answer. Okay, if you'd like to change your view, you'd click the upper right hand button. Um, now, if you click gallery view, you're going to see a, a thumb like pattern of um, all the participants in this presentation, um, or you can click on speaker view and you will only see the person who is speaking. And of course, if you want to leave the workshop, then you click this red button in the lower right hand corner of your screen to leave the workshop. We ask that folks please stick around. Um, we do have post workshop polls. It really helps us evaluate if you learned anything um, and it helps us with our programming. Okay, now if we were in person, I would have this poster right here. Basically, it just states that extension programs are federally funded and our programs are open to everyone. And there is a USDA contact if you would like. And of course, you can always email us at lwf at unr.edu if you have any other questions. Okay, so I'm going to ask that um, somebody please do the pre-workshop poll questions. So these pre-workshop poll questions that just came up. Um, it just assesses um, where you live, uh, how you identify yourself as, um, and, and it shows us what your understanding is before this presentation. Um, so it kind of really helps the, the speakers know where they should focus on and who they're talking to. I'm going to leave a few more seconds up so folks can um, vote. It's really interesting because I can see um, all of the percentages change as, as people vote. I'm going 
going to leave a few more, leave this polling up for a few more seconds as more people vote. We almost have about half of the audience voted. Um, the, by the way, I am going to share these results, but we don't see who says what. We just see the percentage. So this is somewhat anonymous. Okay, I'm going to end the polling and share the results. Oh, it looks like we still have a few more voting. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end this and share the results. Okay, so it looks like about 65% of you who voted uh, live in Nevada, 10% live in the Lake Tahoe Basin, 15% California, 10% uh, Oregon. Welcome, welcome. 55% uh, of you identify as homeowners. 15% um, are agency staff, 15% land management, 15% other. Um, do you have a good understanding of how wildfire smoke is forecasted and how it impacts the air quality index? Um, a majority of you, 55% said sort of, you sort of understand that. Um, fourth question, do you have a good understanding of the health effects of air pollution on one's health? 60% uh, of you said you sort of understand that. And are you familiar with how to protect yourself from wildfire smoke? About 60% of you said yes, 40% of you said sort of. And the last question is, do you know how or where to check the air quality index in your region? 55% said yes, 30% said sort of. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing these results. Thanks for voting. Stop sharing my screen. Um, let's see. So I'm going to introduce you to the first speaker. His name is Chris Smallcomb. He is the Warning Coordination Meteorologist, a public information officer with the National Weather Service Reno office. Welcome, Chris. Hey, thank you so much, Jamie. I uh, appreciate the introduction. And um, Hi, everyone. Uh, again, uh, Chris with the National Weather Service uh, here in Reno. And uh, I've been in the Weather Service, let's see, 21 years now. Um, and been all over the uh, US, including Texas, Kentucky, DC, Salt Lake City. So uh, I've been in Reno for quite a while, about 14 years now, and thoroughly love it, aside from the smoke, uh, which we're already having a taste of with that fire near Portola. So um, what I'm going to do is get my uh, presentation going here. And First, do need to uh, share my screen and uh, go ahead and do that. And let's see here. Let's stop that. Let me make sure I'm doing the right one here. Yep, desktop one. Okay. And I'm going to present here. Sorry if I talk to myself here. It just uh, goes with the uh, goes with the territory, huh? All right, and uh, the speaker notes over here. All right, so what I am going to be uh, talking about today is um, how does weather affect smoke production, smoke movement? Um, you know, winds, of course, have a lot to do with it, but there's other factors as well. Um, what are the smoke models that we use to help predict where that wildfire smoke is going to go? Uh, what are the strengths and weaknesses of that? What are the limits of predictability of that? And uh, so that'll sort of set the stage for what Brendan's going to talk about, which is, is more of the smoke monitoring and the health impacts of uh, wildfire smoke. So just talking from the weather services perspective, um, how do we predict where smoke is gonna go? Um, and uh, hopefully I don't uh, bore you too much with it, but I do run a fair amount and I do run at times where perhaps I shouldn't, uh, including when there's uh, dense smoke and uh, hot temperatures. Uh, last year, I got a bit of that. So uh, you'll see a few pictures of that, like the, there's one of my run commutes into the office there. Um, admittedly, my, uh, my bar, for when I think it's okay to run my, in terms of the air quality index might have risen just a little bit. It's like, oh yeah, it's, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, you know, I can still see a few miles, you know, but uh, probably not the best decision, but not my worst decision um, either. So, all right, so let's move on. Um, so in the weather service, you know, one of the things is smoke forecasting is not something that you're taught in meteorology school. Um, you know, I went to University of Wisconsin-Madison. That is definitely something I did not learn 
uh, there. And so it's, it's very much something you learn when you get into the weather service, it, it, but it's more uh, that we've had experience with hazmat incidents. We run models uh, such as high split that uh, if you have a hazmat incident, such as a tanker explosion or something like that, you can predict where is that plume of material going to go. And that's a, it, the, the map on your screen is kind of showing you an example um, of that. And so, uh, you know, we've kind of parlayed that experience into um, trying to predict where smoke plumes are gonna go. In fact, before we even had smoke models, uh, we would actually use this high split model to say, okay, there's a fire here now. Uh, let's uh, let's go in and, and run a model to see where is that smoke going to go. But now we have automated models that know where the fires are and use real meteorology updated hourly to predict where the, the smoke is going to go. So in just the past five or 10 years, that uh, has advanced significantly. And yet another reason to be kind of, it's an exciting time to be a meteorologist uh, just because we have all these new tools um, at our disposal. Um, so, you know, the other thing I want to emphasize, uh, you know, just in terms of our job is, is, is really, we're, we're just trying to predict where the smoke is going to go. Uh, the health impacts, the AQI, that is not our lane. That's Brendan's lane at the Washoe uh, County Air Quality District and all the other air quality districts around the, the states um, that, that do that. But you know, we do model where the smoke is gonna go because that does impact the weather. So um, as an aside, when we had the really thick smoke last year, it actually did cool the high temperatures a little bit. You know, that kept a lot of that solar radiation from coming in. And so it did cool temperatures a bit, which affects our, um, our, our forecast. What's interesting though, is at night, uh, when the heat escapes back to space and we cool off, the smoke actually doesn't have an influencer. You think it might act like a blanket and kind of keep the heat in. It doesn't actually. That energy is still able to escape through the, uh, the smoke. So we have cooler high temperatures, but just as cool uh, low temperatures like we uh, we did in September. So that's kind of our role. We predict where the smoke is going to go, and that's really up to the air quality districts um, to issue alerts and medical and health advice. Um, so moving along here, our experiences in 2020, uh, of course, ended up being a huge year for smoke decision support. So this is where um, you know, really put those models uh, to use and, and help give briefings to various public safety agencies on where do you expect the wildfire smoke to go. <clears throat> but we can only go so far with that because we're, again, we're not air quality experts, we're meteorologists. Um, and so uh, there's, there's a difference. And uh, so uh, a lot of times we would actually team up with our friends in the, in the air quality management districts. And the biggest example of that was working with Brendan and others at Washoe County uh, with the school district. Um, because of uh, COVID, uh, you know, they're trying to keep the schools open, but they had to recirculate fresh air from the outside. Well, when the smoke is too thick, that's not a good option because you're bringing in terrible air into the classroom. So we would brief the school district leadership up to the superintendent level um, each day on what we expected for the next day so that they could make a kind of a go, no go decision. So again, that was something I had no concept of, of possibly doing uh, you know, a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. So, uh, you know, the, the role of a meteorologist is definitely changing. And so this is just a, an, a, an example um, of that last year. So, uh, you know, the weather, of course, influences smoke significantly and in, in, in winds, absolutely. That's probably the biggest player in where smoke is going to go. The winds in what we call the mixing layer, which is basically from the surface to the, say, lowest few thousand feet in the atmosphere. Sometimes it varies. It can be just, say, the lowest 5,000 feet of the atmosphere. Or if it's a hot summer day, it could be the lowest, say, 10 or even 15,000 feet of the atmosphere. What are the winds doing there? That's going to help drive where the uh, where the smoke goes. Um, but other factors, the other one is atmospheric stability. And you probably heard this term on, on TV before. It's like, oh, the atmosphere is unstable. What does that mean? You know, it's actually kind of a, an obscure concept. Um, but basically is when you try and you know, when you get clouds to form, you, the air is rising to create those those clouds. Well, when the atmosphere is unstable, when you lift air to create those clouds, it actually keeps going, keeps going up, and it creates more clouds and perhaps eventually thunderstorms and things like that. When the atmosphere is stable and you try and lift that air mass, or you know, there's a mechanism trying to lift that air mass, it falls back down to the ground. And so that's the difference there. So that has a huge driver on what smoke does, because when the air mass is stable, you know, the smoke from a wildfire is gonna try and go up, but uh, the air mass is stable. And so it traps the smoke 
near the ground and in valleys and things like that. That often happens in the early morning hours when uh, you have these inversions and it traps the, uh, the smoke in the valleys. But in the afternoon, generally the air mass becomes more unstable and you, so you see the smoke lofting higher and higher into the, uh, into the atmosphere. And if uh, any of you who've been watching um, off to, to the Northwest toward Potola the last couple of days, you've seen all of that uh, going on with a, a pretty um, impressive smoke plume that it's getting up to about 20,000 feet um, off of the uh, the fire near uh, near Frenchman Lake. So this video that I'm going to show you, and I'm going to pause it in a couple spots, especially for those uh, may have uh, good bandwidth, you know, just so you can catch up. But this is a video from the uh, alert uh, wildfire cameras looking at the East Fork fire that took place last week between Markleyville and Minden. And there's a lot of what I just talked about going on here. So I'm going to go ahead and play that. So. Here we are early in the morning. This is about 7.15 on July 2nd. And here's where the fire is. Look at how the smoke is just trapped in the valleys. This is again, uh, you have a stable air mass that's trapping the smoke in the valleys. Uh, there's, there's cool air kind of settling into the valleys. Cool air is more dense, so it's gonna fall into those valleys. And it traps the smoke there. We see this all the time here in our complex terrain where you have a wildfire or even a prescribed burn that smoke can just settle into the valleys. Whereas people up on the ridges, notice these ridges here, a lot less smoke in those areas. So we're gonna keep going uh, through the morning hours and, and you can kind of see the smoke sticking to the valleys here about 8 a.m. and getting toward about 8.45, here's about 9 a.m. Now notice how the smoke is, here's about 9.15 a.m. Notice how the smoke is getting a little bit higher. So what's happening is you're seeing a little bit of that unstable atmosphere start to develop, but it's very short. It's not, the smoke is just getting up just a little bit there. And uh, here we go on to about 9.30 and, and the smoke is kind of doing the same thing, but it's still largely trapped in these valleys here. And finally, up oh, here we go, about 10.45, Notice how the plume, the fire's getting more active, but the plume is going straight up. And uh, that's where the air mass is becoming more unstable. But you notice the, the smoke isn't really going anywhere. So in this case, there's not a whole lot of wind. So it's all driven by how unstable the air mass is, is becoming. So the smoke is going up in the air and then otherwise it's sort of sloshing around in those valleys. So now the camera's gonna do some funky things here. So we'll let it do it. So let it go through its freak out here. Um, so here is, um, this is at about 11.30 in the morning. You notice again, that, that big smoke plume pretty much going straight up there. The air mass is becoming um, unstable and uh, we're gonna kind of keep going. Oh, here we go. This is where, um, let me go right here. So here, notice how the plume is going straight up and it's actually generating its own cloud up here. Uh, and that's called a pyrocumulus cloud. So if you ever see one of those, that means the fire is extremely active the air mass is very unstable. And so you're gonna get smoke lofting to, to several thousand or, or even tens of thousands of feet into the, uh, into the atmosphere. So again, stability of the atmosphere is a big driver. Uh, look at that, it's just impressive pyrocumulus cloud, very uh, active fire behavior. Now, what we're gonna see here shortly is this is a day where we had thunderstorms in the area. And so of course, thunderstorms generate outflow winds, You know, sometimes 40, 50, 60 mile an hour winds. So what you'll see here, oh, it's raining. Oh, yay, it's raining. So there's no worries, right? The fire is gonna go out. Well, unfortunately it rained at the camera, but it did not rain at the fire. Notice how all of a sudden the smoke from the fire is bending over to the left. See, look at that. It's getting more active, but bending over to the left. That's the outflow wind from the thunderstorm. So you have wind affecting the fire and the smoke movement as well. So this is a, a situation where all of a sudden people to the north of the fire are getting uh, choked in smoke just because of a change in the wind direction because of a thunderstorm. So all in all, this is a, a great example of how wind and stability in the atmosphere drive smoke movement. All right, so we're gonna move along here. Now, of course, thunderstorms are also, uh, I mentioned, you know, we, we saw the thunderstorm um, you know, affect the, the smoke movement, but sometimes you can go from what looks like a really good air quality forecast to one that's not so good. This is what we call the American fire smoke tsunami that came into Reno uh, in August of 2013 here. And I think you can kind of sense what I'm talking about here. I mean, look at that, just giant wall of smoke spilling over the Sierra right into Reno. This is viewed from the NWS office. We're up by TMCC looking out over, uh, over Reno here. I'll play it one more time. So thunderstorm outflow boundaries, 
Uh, they're not too predictable. They're very chaotic, um, especially around here. Thunderstorms tend to pop up uh, here and there. Uh, we kind of affectionately call them the drunk thunderstorms because they're just sort of all over the place and moving different directions. There's outflow boundaries all over the place. They're colliding and generating new thunderstorms. So that's if that kind of stuff interacts with a fire, it makes it very tough to predict where is that smoke going to go? What's the fire behavior um, going to do. So that's one of the limitations of our smoke modeling is being able to, is is dealing with thunderstorm influences. That's where things can go off off the rails on the forecast. All right. So our smoke model, the main one that we use is the HER smoke model, high, high resolution rapid refresh. You can Google this, and I'll show you some uh, a link to uh, to the actual model data. You can see this for yourself. Um, that's it's available publicly and it uses satellite information to detect where fires are how big they are how hot they're burning and that data gets all put into the model along with the atmospheric forecast at a very high resolution out to about 48 hours into the uh, into the future at a three kilometer resolution so and it's updated every hour uh, with new data new atmospheric data and, and new fire um, data so uh, all that gets put into a model and then we get to use the output to predict where the uh, smoke plume is going to go. So this is actually uh, from yesterday afternoon. Uh, you can see the smoke plume here in eastern Plumas County. This is the uh, this is the Beckworth Complex fire that's near Frenchman Lake, another fire northwest or northeast of Klamath Falls. So it's like okay, you can see the smoke plume there, but how does the computer know there's a fire there? Well, there's another channel on our satellite called the Fire Temperature Channel. And it shows these hot spots. Look at that. You can see it stand out there. It's actually seeing the heat from the fire. Now, mind you, the satellite is 22,000 miles away above us. So it's pretty impressive. They can see that at that definition. But this is the kind of data the computer uses to, to be able to know that there's a fire there, how hot it's burning, and then, and then simulate how much smoke is, uh, is coming from that. In fact, we use this channel at the Weather Service to help fire agencies detect new fires especially in rugged and remote terrain where there may not be people around to know there's a fire there, uh, say a lightning caused fire, a lightning holdover. So we actually use this in, in that respect as well. And so here's, there's, a, there's a picture of the, uh, the smoke plume from the, uh, the Beckworth fire around the, uh, the same time yesterday. All right, so the smoke models produce a couple key parameters that we use to, uh, to forecast uh, smoke uh, movement and, and potential density of that smoke. One is near surface smoke, um, and this is a, in, in micrograms per cubic meter. And this is a plot from the, the website. If you, again, you Google her smoke, and this is the link down here, and you know, that'll be available in the, in the recording as well. Um, and, and this map here is from yesterday's model showing you the, uh, the smoke plumes, uh, mainly from the Oregon fire, but also you know, ones up in, uh, in Idaho. And this is the smoke, again, near the ground. Uh, nothing complicated about that. But um, then there's also another parameter called vertically integrated smoke. And this is for the same time, but this is actually looking at the smoke throughout the entire layer of the atmosphere. And so what this shows you is smoke that may be up at like 30,000 feet, 20,000 feet. It's not near the ground, but it's up there and could still have potential impacts on the weather or um, visibility and things like that for, for flying um, as, as an example. So here you can see, look how far that smoke is being transported into the Dakotas from those fires in, in Oregon and in, in Idaho. So this is where these two parameters are, are quite useful. Now I'm going to back up one, uh, one deal here, actually, let me go back one, is the colors that you see here are purely just that smoke concentration. They're not necessarily one-to-one uh, -one correlation with air quality index. So the air quality index that you see online factors in other variables as well. And Brendan will, will talk about this. You know, there's other, other pollutants and other things that, that do get factored in. But what you can do here is a, it's a relative sense of how bad it is. You know, so generally my rule of thumb is the blues and the greens are haze. The yellows and oranges are, okay, not smoky, but not, not awful yet. The reds and purples, it's you know, it's done. You know, that's that's pretty thick smoke. Um, you know, you're probably going to see pretty significant air quality impacts at that point. But again, this is just looking at pure concentration of that smoke, that PM 2.5 um, pollutant there from from the smoke. So, um, on this one here, the uh, the smoke models, of course, they're great, but you know, they have the limitations. I talked about this already. Um, you can see the existing smoke trapped in these valleys. 
sometimes the model doesn't know that that's there. You know, we have all the great satellite data and everything else to look at that gets ingested. You know, you know, we can see it, but sometimes the computer can't, especially at night when there's not that visible imagery that you can actually see the smoke that's trapped in the valley. So sometimes the model will start off with an incorrect condition of the existing smoke, um, but yet it knows smoke is being produced by nearby wildfires, but it's that stuff trapped in the valley. So that's something we look at as meteorologists to be able to kind of correct for when it comes to a forecast. So if you ever look at those, those smoke model images there, um, that's one thing to keep in mind is, is make sure, is, is it representing what's actually out there right now? Um, the, uh, the wind patterns, um, you know, it, it has to look at, you know, very small scale wind patterns. So um, just subtle things like terrain flows, drainage winds down valley at night, uh, thunderstorm boundaries, things like that. Um, especially when you get beyond 36 hours, that's where the model becomes probably a little bit less reliable. But that first 24 to 36 hours generally is, is not too bad. Thunderstorms, I already talked about that, those outflow boundaries, that just throws a lot of chaos into the mix of where that smoke is going to go. And last but not least, brand new fires. And so that's a case with the, uh, the fire up near Portola. Um, you know, that one ended up uh, resurging, uh, you know, a couple days ago. And, and the model didn't really know it was, had done that until about six hours later when it got a good satellite snapshot of a really intense heat signature. And so um, during the first, say, three to six hours of a new fire, the smoke model is not going to have caught up with it yet. And so that's where us as meteorologists, we have to use the satellite to kind of extrapolate where that smoke could go and who it could impact and message that uh, and then wait for the smoke model to catch up. Once it becomes a well-established fire, it's generally good guidance, especially in the first 24, 36 hours. So with all that in mind, let's take a look at a, a, a few forecasts leading up to the worst of the worst smoke that we've uh, seen in Reno. Uh, and Brendan will talk more about this, September 12th, 13th of last year. And uh, as I mentioned before, um, I, uh, I try and make good decisions, but I don't guarantee I make good decisions. And, and one of them was taking a run uh, the afternoon of the 13th, when it was 92 degrees and the AQI was 178. Um, so yeah, that was, uh, that was interesting. But at least my daughter Savannah was there to give me a, a nice uh, cold water bath with a hose when I, uh, when I finished. She absolutely loves doing that. So uh, at the Weather Service Arena, we do something that's called the freakout chart. This is uh, mainly for our emergency managers and public safety partners. It's a kind of a, it's a threat matrix. A, it's a triage which weather issues are going to be a problem over the next seven days. And smoke is one of them. Honestly, when we started the freakout chart in 2017, this is not on there, but it's kind of become a need uh, for this, uh, given, given the climate, given the, the amount of fire. So we're looking again at the 12th and 13th. And, and you know, we had kind of that low to moderate freakout level for smoke. You know, we knew there'd probably be some in the area, but we really had no clue it was going to be anything really bad, you know, we, we thought the next couple days could be bad, uh, you know, getting the purple, that's something we, we only do maybe a couple times a year. Um, but in terms of the 12th and 13th, didn't really have a, a good sense at that point. Again, that goes to the predictability horizon. Generally, smoke forecasts are the most predictable in that 24 to 36 hour time horizon. Beyond that, we get a little bit less predictable, actually quite a bit less predictable at that point. Now, the next day on uh, September 11th, so just a day before we start uh, hitting those big AQI and smoke numbers here in Reno, um, we started getting a sense that it was going to be smoky, but we had no, again, no clue it was going to be like record setting smoke. So we had red, you know, high to moderate freak out levels for smoke. We knew it was going to be an issue, but you know, predicting that it was going to be some kind of record setting event was not, uh, not feasible at, the, at this standpoint. So these are some maps that we use. Um, they're based on that same data that I showed you earlier on those, those other maps. It's just, these are kind of prettied up a bit on, uh, but you know, essentially the, you know, the same scales um, kind of apply here. And so it showed here uh, thick smoke kind of pouring back into Reno by early on the 12th, that Saturday morning, early on the 12th. So we knew it was going to be just nasty as soon as people woke up at 3 a.m. on that Saturday. And we were able to message that. And this is what that Zephyr breeze. So any of you who live here in, in the Reno, Carson City, Western Nevada area, you know about the Zephyr wind that kicks in every summer afternoon. Well, the Zephyr wind is generally a good thing. It kind of cools us a little bit, a little bit more humidity, but it can also bring smoke in 
uh, when we have fires to our west in the, uh, in the central and northern Sierra. Well, this is the case here. Now, uh, we, you know, we saw the smoke Saturday from that simulation on, on Friday, uh, but it suggested the smoke might thin out um, and what we call mixing out. That's that, that process where the smoke, remember that uh, video I showed you earlier where the smoke plume all of a sudden, instead of being trapped in the valleys, it started lofting up. Well, that's a process called mixing out and that's where the smoke becomes more dispersed. It might get lofted higher and then get carried away by winds aloft. Uh, so that was the sort of the general expectation here is that it would it would it would still be smoky, but it wasn't going to be maybe as bad in, in the afternoon. Well, uh, phrase wrong again, Bob is uh, pertinent here because that smoke just stuck around. Uh, you know, one thing with the smoke is it did actually kind of put the kibosh on some of that mixing. The smoke was thick enough that we did not get as hot temperature wise and, and hot temperatures are one of the drivers of that mixing of developing those plumes there and it didn't get as hot and so this is the satellite we woke up to and that smoke just stuck around throughout the uh, throughout the entire day and so that was you know that was a, a failure in the model to anticipate the effects of that smoke on temperatures and the amount of mixing and things like that so it stuck around all day one thing that's neat about this up notice how the ridges around Tahoe are relatively clean relatively speaking. So again, that smoke was trapped in the valleys and it kind of stayed there. Now, we're trying to look ahead to what Sunday is gonna bring. So the 13th, remember it was both the 12th and the 13th, we had those record setting air quality and smoke values in, in Reno. And the model was like, okay, you know, not, you know, not too bad, but it also wasn't really picking up on that existing smoke as, as thick as it, as it was. Uh, but it was still indicating that, okay, it's gonna be smoky, but not, not too bad, and uh, yeah, that didn't uh, that didn't quite work out. So again, it was just that the model didn't really pick up on the fact that that smoke kept trapped in the valleys because the winds that Zephyr wasn't as strong as it used to be. The amount of mixing, the air air mass didn't become as unstable to mix out that smoke the previous day, and so it just all kind of stagnated and hung around. So this is a case where the model didn't do a bad job at predicting that the smoke would come in. But it did a bad job at predicting that this when the smoke would leave, and so that's you know just an example of of that kind of thing. And so here's the air quality, at least in terms of the smoke, the PM two point five. Uh, it was into the the red and the purple range, and actually a dark uh, purple here, the hazardous air quality um, up here near uh, near Doyle. And so um, you can you can see the trends uh, there. So it didn't really uh, didn't really leave. And uh, here's an example of where the uh, you know the smoke the the model on that Sunday the 13th kind of missed that the smoke was as thick as it was and so therefore it kind of goes into the future thinking oh it's starting off with not as bad a situation and uh, so we kind of have to correct for that as meteorologists Some, you know again the smoke model does a great job in many cases but there are times where you really have to be on the ball of like okay is it representing the current environment accurately. Uh, or not. So uh, we're getting better. It's a, it's a great time to see this kind of data because, you know, we wouldn't have had this 10 years ago or even five years ago, um, but we still have to, you know, it's still not perfect um, by any means. So I'm going to finish up here and then hand it off to uh, to Brendan. There's an ash devil on Peavine. I'm sure you've seen some of those around. Uh, it's basically a dust devil with ash on it. So smoke forecasting in general with the models that we have is pretty decent 24 to 36 hours into the future. Uh, but beyond that, it's really not all that great. And even in the first 24, 36 hours, we have to look at very general trends in smoke, you know, to be able to say, okay, in Sparks at 2 p.m. tomorrow, the smoke is gonna be this dense. Yeah, I wouldn't get that specific, you know, that's where we, but we can talk about just sort of general bulk trends. Uh, thunderstorm outflows, new fires and smoke trapped in valleys can uh, mess up those forecasts real quick. So this is where we as meteorologists, as forecasters, really take a look at these kind of things to kind of correct what the model is showing. And uh, it, just keep in mind, if you do look at this data to help maybe plan, like I do, plan a run or something like that, um, just remember that these model smoke levels aren't the full equation when it comes to air quality uh, index. The, the model can show you generally where it, the smoke is thinner or it's denser, but in terms of correlating it with uh, an AQI that might, you might be familiar with, uh, that there's more to it uh, than just looking at the, the raw smoke data there. So I'm going to uh, stop my presentation there, stop sharing the screen there. And uh, I think that's what I have. So Jamie, I'll toss it back to you.
Thanks, Chris. As always, um, very informative and interesting. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation. I, um, before I introduce the next speaker, I just wanted folks to know that this recording will be made available um, to you in in a couple months. Sorry, a couple weeks to a month, um, as well as the presentations. We have to make these ADA accessible before we send them out, and it does take us some time. Um, but I just want to send out that reminder that yes, this will be made available here in a few weeks to a month. Month. Okay, so let's move on to the next presenter, and this is Brendan Schneider. He is the Air Quality Specialist with the Washoe County Health District Air Quality Management Division. Uh, I'm super excited for this presentation, um, and I want to welcome Brendan. Thanks, Jamie. Um, thanks for having me, the Living with Fire folks and everybody uh, on the Zoom call, and uh, Chris, uh, Thanks for co-presenting. I always learn something new. And uh, yeah, let me share my screen. Can everybody see it? Everyone see it? Okay. All right. So um, thanks for having me again. Um, my name is Brendan Schneider I'm with the Washoe County Health District Air Quality Management Division. Um, I help out the uh, monitoring and planning branches in air quality, and uh, I work with the data. I'm the data manager. Um, I get to figure out how to get the data from our monitors to the public in a timely fashion so that they can make um, public health decisions. Um, the National Weather Service, Reno, is one of our partners. They help us immensely with trying to figure out where the smoke is going to go or if there's any dust storms coming. Um, it helps us uh, get the um, information to the public. And we also tend to borrow images and videos from them, just like my first slide that was taken up at their office um, by one of their meteorologists. So let's go on to the first slide. So first things first, this is where all the data comes from uh, that we use to calculate the AQI that shows up on air now. Um, this map has eight dots. It has one of our older monitoring stations on there, but it has uh, seven SLAMs, which stands for state or local air monitoring stations. Um, they meet EPA requirements. Um, we do an annual network plan, also a five-year network assessment. And anything we do to these monitors is approved by EPA. Um, Reno 4, our newest um, air monitoring station, started in uh, 2020. Um, it's one of six, uh, one of 63 uh, urban NCOR stations throughout the country. Um, and currently it's conducting a uh, national wildfire impact study uh, with EPA. So there's a lot more instrumentation in that monitoring site. Um, We've been monitoring in our uh, Truckee Meadows for um, 58 years now. Our first data point uh, was in Reno in 1963. Um, this is Reno 4. This is our newest site. Um, has all the instrumentation you can think of on top of it and quite a bit inside of it as well. Um, this monitors for gaseous pollutants like ozone, carbon monoxide, uh, nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide, and particulates. Uh, PM 2.5, PM 10, PM coarse, and um, we also monitor up on that tower the um, MET parameters like ambient temperature, wind speed, wind direction, and relative humidity. So we started this site uh, January 1st of 2020. Um, we had to move our Reno 3 monitoring station, and this is uh, where it was located at the Libby Booth Elementary Campus. Okay, so the data that is collected at these sites uh, are used in two main ways. Uh, it helps us determine whether or not we are in attainment or non-attainment of the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. That is just to say if we are um, have clean air or dirty air and if we need to do something about those things. Um, another way we use the data is to calculate the uh, AQI. Uh, this is more or less for public health protection. 
Um, we have valuable data that we collect every hour of every day. Um, so this is our way of um, letting the public know what they are breathing. Um, we send the data um, every hour to AirNow, and that is what we all use um, throughout the country to determine what the air quality is at any given time. Um, now the AQI, the way it's calculated is a couple different ways. Um, the scale is from zero to 500, you know, the color code of green, yellow, orange, red, purple, and maroon. Um, we'll be talking a little bit about the uh, purple category today. Uh, Chris touched on that um, in mid-September of last year. Um, we, let's go to air now, now. Okay, so air now. This is what everyone uses. This is what Chris showed in his previous slide, um, spe specifically the fire and smoke map. Um, this is the quickest way we can get the data to the public, um, but it's important to know uh, that there are limitations just like smoke forecasting. Um, it's up to 90 minutes delayed. Uh, so when smoke hits and the monitor is taken, the smoky air, it could be up to 90 minutes until that is visible on AirNow's AQI and calculated with it. Um, all of our seven monitors that I showed you, uh, whichever one's highest is the AQI that's displayed for Reno Sparks. Um, it's also not official. This is considered preliminary data. Sometimes there are errors, sometimes there are power failures, there's other issues that happen um, that can affect the AQI. Uh, when you work with near real-time data, things happen. Uh, it's not perfect. Um, but yeah, uh, AQI, I think everyone's really familiar with AirNow if they've gone to that website, airnow.gov. Um, it has uh, been refreshed recently in the last two years, um, and it now includes the uh, fire and smoke map. Um, the fire and smoke map now includes um, not only our regulatory monitors, which are shown here in the uh, uh, circle icons, but also the air sensors, which are shown in these uh, squares. Um, these are, think of them like uh, home weather stations, but for air quality. Uh, you can purchase them and install at your own house, and you can choose to display that data um, alongside our regulatory monitors. And this helps us. This helps us figure out where the smoke is and what the concentrations are um, to a certain extent. Uh, all of our sites meet strict requirements for siting. Um, air sensors do not. They don't get checked once they get plugged in, um, but they can provide us a general sense of where smoke is and how bad it could be. Okay. Now, the health effects of air pollution. First pollutant I'm going to talk about is particulate matter. Um, uh, it's the primary pollutant of concern when wildfire smoke hits us. Uh, fine particulates in particular um, of the PM 2.5, which means it's uh, particulate matter less than 2.5 microns in diameter. So the um, scale uh, uh, image I've shown here shows it compared to a human hair or fine beach sand to show you how small these particles are. Um, they're small enough so they can get trapped deep into your lungs and can cause a variety of things such as uh, coughing, wheezing, uh, shortness of breath, uh, aggravate your asthma, um, can cause lung damage, um, can lead to premature death um, and low birth weight in infants. Uh, there's actually a study back in the late 90s uh, about PM pollution um, in Reno that uh, looked at low birth weight in infants. Um, when you inhale a lot of smoke, uh, your body tries to fight it off. Uh, it can suppress immune response and lead you to more susceptibility of uh, viruses, bacteria, um, and that includes COVID-19. Uh, there were two uh, studies done in 2020 that showed a correlation between um, uh, air quality and infection of COVID-19. So uh, there isn't just one pollutant, there's quite a few of them. Um, one that 
sometimes gets overlooked because it's invisible to us um, is ozone. It can also be um, a concern uh, during wildfire time. Um, it is important for us uh, to have lots of ozone high in the uh, stratosphere, uh, but down at the ground level, it is an air pollutant and can cause uh, certain health effects. Um, it can lead you to cough more, irritate your throat, um, gives you sort of a pain burning sense when you take a deep breath. Uh, people think of it sort of like a sunburn, but to your lungs. Um, it can cause chest tightness, wheezing and shortness of breath at high concentrations. Um, it's usually always our summertime pollutant of concern if there isn't any wildfire smoke. Um, it always peaks during the afternoons when it's hot and sunny. Um, but you need two components, you need nitrogen, uh, oxides of nitrogen and volatile organic compounds um, to make ozone. Those are unfortunately both found in wildfire smoke in copious amounts. Uh, so when wildfire smoke hits, it can cause uh, ozone concentrations to spike um, to a certain extent. Uh, light amounts of smoke seem to be more favorable for ozone formation. Uh, really thick amounts of smoke can uh, possibly inhibit ozone formation because it prohibits uh, uh, sunlight from reaching the ground level, which is needed to form ozone. Um, now, important to note, the fire and smoke map that has been referred to in previous slides uh, does not list ozone as a pollutant. Um, so if ozone is high and the smoke, fire and smoke map appears to be good or moderate, um, it will not be displayed there. It'll only be displayed on the main airnow.gov uh, webpage. So um, when all these wildfires started up, uh, when I first started here, uh, we didn't have really an outreach campaign to address um, exposure to wildfire smoke. Um, we, we had um, action sort of campaigns like uh, don't use your uh, wood stove tonight, like the Red Burn Code, uh, be idle free, go, um, 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 you know, active transportation, limit your vehicle miles travel, that sort of thing. So this was developed actually after the um, summer of the Rim Fire, which I'll talk about a little bit later as well, um, to better prepare everybody for what to do when wildfire smoke hits. Um, so Be Smoke Smart is mainly a campaign to reduce um, your exposure um, to wildfire smoke as best you can. Um, and it had to be adapted last year for the COVID-19 pandemic. So the next slide will have uh, sort of our tips, our top 10 tips that you can do to protect yourself with sort of a COVID twist. Um, and I highlighted it with orange and yellow to highlight sort of things that go against the COVID-19 um, uh, guidance um, and uh, things that we had to change um, to better address the situation. Um, so always the first thing we suggest whenever wildfire smoke hits, um, reduce or stop outdoor activity and stay inside. You know, um, keeping indoor air clean is key during this time. Oop, keeps on transitioning. Um, and Taking many breaks outside, reducing your activity is key as well. Um, trying to reduce uh, the amount of smoke you're breathing in. Um, now, when it gets to hazardous conditions, everyone should stay inside. Uh, it, it's very difficult to um, uh, be active when it's smoky. You'll start feeling it really quickly. Um, so hopefully your body can tell you as well when you need to stay inside. But the AQI can as well. Um, keep AC on it if available. Uh, fresh air intake closed, filter clean and windows closed. So fresh air intake closed, um, like um, Chris mentioned, the uh, school district had to um, allow more fresh air in. Uh, this uh, is not a good situation when wildfire smoke is, is around the schools. 
Um, it'll bring more smoke in and it can even concentrate in rooms or hallways like was seen in some schools. Um, and then windows closed. So the transport of students was also a consideration. They uh, kept bus windows open um, uh, to address the COVID situation, uh, but that wasn't good when it was smoky. Um, pay attention to air quality on airnow.gov. Um, we send data there 24 hours a day um, and it's the best resource we have to let people know what's going on outside. Um, follow the advice of your doctor, especially those with heart and lung disease. You know, I'm not a physician. Uh, you know, I'm not going to direct you to how to, um, you know, uh, administer an inhaler or uh, what you should do if you're on oxygen. This is something that needs to be uh, talked about and discussed with your own uh, doctor. Um, we can make general um, guidance of staying inside, reducing activity, um, but we are not going to be uh, ones for that sort of health guidance. Um, we need to understand that uh, for COVID, to reduce the spread of COVID-19, the face coverings do not protect you from ozone or fine particulates. Both, both of these pollutants are very small and can go through um, the cotton masks very well. Um, and it could even force you to breathe more uh, because you are breathing uh, through a mask. Um, you also need to understand that N95 respirators um, can provide some protection, but should, re should be reserved for frontline health emergency personnel. Um, so that was uh, determined to be added to this list um, during last summer when um, there was a potential shortage of uh, respirators for um, hospital workers and people of that nature. Um, our previous Be Smoke Smart uh, tips included sort of a, you know, um, respirators are okay if you're must be outside if you're an active adult, um, but only in that sort of situation. Um, they're not designed for kids. Uh, they're not designed for people with beards. Uh, there's all these other limitations to them and you need to be fit tested um, by someone that knows how to do that. Um, staying hydrated, usually during wildfire season, it's always hot. That's just another thing to, um, to consider. Uh, staying hydrated is important for everybody during those times. It also keeps your airways um, lubricated in such a way um, and can help uh, with the situation. Um, keeping indoor air is key to this whole thing. Uh, don't burn candles, vacuum or smoke tobacco products. Anything that can generate some sort of particulate in the air inside your house, you want to do none of that. Um, clean something with something that's like a wet cloth. Don't uh, get more and more particulates in the air than is needed. Um, Use a portable air purifier. Those can really help keep your um, home clean. Um, and in the worst case scenario, you can even make your own clean air room. Um, and there is uh, instructions on how to do such a thing on our website. Um, and then if, if you've been in the smoke for a long period of time, it can be kind of depressing. You, you can't really go outside or you feel like you should be going outside and um, possibly consider relocating temporarily if you can. Um, I understand completely how people feel when that happens. Um, it's not a good situation if you're experiencing smoke for a long time like we did in previous instances. So uh, wildfire smoke in Washoe County, the top 10 worst days in Washoe County since 1963 have all occurred in the last 13 years. Um, it really started in 2008 with the wildfires that started after a massive lightning storm um, that had the all time highest day until um, 2020. Uh, the Rim Fire, the American Fire, I believe Chris showed the outflow from the American Fire, but not so long after that, the Rim Fire just south of there um, started up and sent smoke our way. Um, that was what I would think would be a bad situation. And then the King Fire started, um, you know, on the west side there, um, it shows Lake Tahoe and then Pyramid you can see there in the map. Um, it, it was significantly impacting um, parts of Reno, but in a very narrow plume, um, 
it would hit Verdi really hard, but South Reno was fine. They didn't have any smoke. So it was a very narrow effect where the wind sort of shifted the, the smoke. Um, and this is the fire that sort of prompted us to develop Be Smoke Smart um, because we would get inundated with questions and we needed to have some way of addressing um, all the different uh, public questions and media inquiries. Um, so that brings us to 2020. Uh, the 2020 wildfires were very notable for lots of reasons. Um, there were two dozen major wildfires. I'm sure there was more than that um, burning throughout Northern California during this mid-August to mid-October timeframe. Um, according to my estimates, there were 49 days in which at least one of our seven monitors detected elevated levels of smoke. Um, that's a lot. That's that's a record for a year. Um, in particular, the week of September 11th through the 18th, that had six of the top 10 days in terms of a 24 hour average AQI that is not to be confused with an hourly air now AQI. Um, so yeah, you can look at the top 10 uh, days there. It's, uh, I thought 2008, um, was was bad in 2014, but uh, 2020 changed everything. Um, and we actually had our first two days in the very unhealthy range. Um, and those are the days that Chris highlighted, and so will I. So September 12th and 13th um, uh, were in the very unhealthy range, in particular in Spanish Springs. Um, if you were checking early in the morning um, of both those days, um, air now was saying hazardous. So for about eight to 10 hours, it was hazardous AQI on air now. Um, the day averaged in the very unhealthy because it did mix out a little bit, but like Chris mentioned, it stuck around and then it concentrated even more on the 13th. And these maps, um, are from the Air Now Interactive AQI contour map, not to be confused with the fire and smoke map. This just shows sort of the general area of what the um, uh, AQI is from all the different air agencies, um, regulatory monitors, and I believe also the um, portable monitors that uh, agencies like CARB can deploy at, at the actual um, events. So, during very unhealthy air quality, um, you know, this is potentially an emergency sort of condition. Um, active children, adults, people with respiratory disease should avoid all outdoor exertion. Everyone else should limit their outdoor exertion. Um, you know, uh, this prompted us to issue our first um, stage two emergency episode. Um, we have never had to do that. Uh, usually those are reserved for a stage one during the winter time when we say we shouldn't be using wood stoves. Um, but yeah, it was more or less to prompt people that there are some um, unhealthy air quality out there. Um, like Chris mentioned, uh, we were, um, uh, we con consulted with um, Washington County School District National Weather Service to see um, what the air quality was going to be, what it has been, and uh, to help with the decision support to see if um, schools were going to be held or not. Uh, typically during uh, wildfire smoke events, um, classes are not usually canceled, um, usually like recess and after school activities like football games and practices would be rescheduled or, or canceled altogether. But because of those COVID-19 mitigation strategies, um, which includes, I have a good list of them. Um, you know, holding in-person hybrid classes, um, mask wearing, social distancing, outdoor learning, having windows down in buses, like I mentioned, um, increasing turnover of indoor air, um, using outdoor air. Um, those were all used to sort of try to mitigate the spread of COVID-19, but can also help spread wildfire smoke inside, which is uh, not good. Um, 
So uh, the Washington County School District is also planning to add air sensors to areas um, using their schools where there is no PM 2.5 monitors nearby um, in Washoe County. And this will expand sort of that uh, fire and smoke map network um, to better help us and them determine what they should do for their school situation. Um, these air sensors have been added by about three dozen members of the public in Washoe County, including myself, um, Wolfpack Athletics, DRI, UNR, um, and it has all really helped us figure out where the smoke is and potentially how bad it is. So that is all I have. Um, so you can always follow us on Washoe County AQ. Um, I, I'll tweet on there occasionally. We always send out the forecast alerts through there. And here's some of our other brands. Um, you know, idle free, rack them up, know the code, um, no zone and be smoke smart. So uh, thanks again, everybody. And I'll ha be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thanks, Brendan. <laughs> Super interesting. Um, so I think right now we are going to share the um, post workshop poll. And so let me do that. Um, and then we can, while, while I have this poll launching, then we can ask and answer some questions. Again, if you are an attendee, you can ask questions by clicking on the chat box and then typing it to questions for speakers. Um, I wanted to introduce another individual. Um, her name is Ann Hobbs. She's the associate planner. She's with Placer County Air Pollution Control District. Um, she is here to also answer questions for that region if you have any. Um, and so I have a question. So this is going to be for um, the air quality experts. Um, how reliable is the data from those low cost air quality sensors that people can buy and, and have installed at their house? This is a good question. So um, uh, EPA uh, has been doing research on a variety of air sensors um, to determine whether they're reliable or not. Um, and they have determined that these air sensors are reliable, um, despite possibly um, poor sighting. You know, maybe they they put things too close to a barbecue or things like that. Um, but they do have a corrective factor that um, allows those air sensors to be on that fire and smoke map, um, so that it is um, a better representative of what the air quality is. Uh, they tend to be a little bit higher um, on certain. Um, concentrations of smoke and lower in certain instances. So they tried to correct it and um, uh, it does smooth out sort of the peaks that happen sometimes um, during, you know, barbecues and things that people do in their backyards where these sensors could be. Um, so it, it is reasonably accurate. Um, for us, it's not what we use to determine the burn code. That's a regulatory measure, but this is more or less to determine a general trend of where the smoke is um, where we might not have any idea that there is smoke out there because we don't have one of our monitors. Okay. Um, another question is, is Lemon Valley the northernmost monitoring site for Reno? What about for the rest of the county? Yes, let me, is there any way I can share my screen real quick? Um, you know what, um, we've got the, the poll going, um, oh, okay. so it's going to be a little difficult. Um, I haven't seen folks vote in a few seconds. Um, I'm going to, to answer the question. It is barely the most northern most uh, monitoring station. Um, Spanish Springs is pretty close as well, uh, but it also only monitors for ozone in Lemon Valley. Okay. 
Um, once once I stop the post workshop poll, then you can you can show your your okay. screen. Sorry about yeah, I'm that. I'm just going to show the location of of where they are. Okay. Um, let's see another question. Um, can you describe describe how to find your fresh air intake? Um, it's a good question. I'm not sort of an HVAC specialist, uh, and I know there's a bunch of different ways um, people cool their homes. Um, you know, central um, AC is a generally popular way of doing it. Um, we're, we're talking about uh, large intake systems uh, on buildings, um, uh, but at your home, generally, it's you know. I'm not the expert on that sort of, uh, of thing. So. I, I might chime in here, not that I'm an expert either, but yeah. hey, I'll, I'll opine on, on things. Mm. Um, when the smoke is really bad last year, you know, we have a normal house here. Um, I, I, I actually had to get to the point where I put a towel at the base of the doors to outside because the smoke would kind of creep in there. Um, and then in a garage too, even though it's uh, the air intake is actually inside. So it just recirculates if there's no like fresh air intake necessarily. But sometimes it would, the, the blower in the garage would actually grab just a little bit of that smoky air and, uh, and, and get into the house. So, you know, trying to keep stuff out of the garage was tricky. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Brendan. Um, okay, I have another question. Why shouldn't someone vacuum during a wildfire smoke event? Yeah, uh, yeah. Don't clean your house. Um, no, it's uh, vacuuming um, can increase uh, dust. Um, if you're vacuuming your carpet, um, it's always a good idea to dust after you vacuum because you emit more dust into the air. Um, we're talking about a very minor amount of dust. But the general idea is just keep your indoor air clean. Um, uh, don't increase uh, dust or smoke um, when it's already smoky outside. And then um, I got a message. Can you provide more detail on how much safer wearing an N95 or KN95 mask can be? So an N95 respirator um, can uh, help protect people if they have to be active outside. To what extent, it all varies on the concentrations, um, but that is not uh, my realm either. It's more or less, they can help. Um, it's incremental, um, but there is so many variables with how uh, the masks fit. Um, you know, uh, that's sort of the extent of the respirator mask um, talk that I usually give. Um, I do have a question. Um, last year, air purifiers were on back order. Um, and so you mentioned that folks can make their own air purifier. Yeah, um, there, there is um, methods to do that um, using sort of your um, general, you know, whatever the size is, the 15 by 15 or 15 by 20 filters with a large, um, uh, like a portable fan. Um, that that can be used. And uh, I, I know that at certain um, large uh, fire incidents with their central command will have um, sort of uh, makeshift air filter systems using these large fans and, and filters. Um, uh, but also just air purifiers in general can do a really good job, especially if you use it in rooms um, that you don't go in and out of a lot to the outside. Um, and you can keep the air pretty clean in those. Um, okay. Um, somebody in the chat had just mentioned, I'm, I'm going to just read this. Um, in whole home HVAC systems, the air intake is inside of the home, so the air is recirculated, which yes. is good for smoke protection. If you have a swamp cooler or a window AC unit, these intake air from the outside, which is not good. So that was just a good reminder for folks. Yes. Um, I don't have any other questions. I haven't received any new questions either. Um, is there anything else that um, the speakers would like question, to add? Jamie. Oh, sure. Um, I just wanted to ask you guys, 
if you guys can say anything about the difference between prescribed fire smoke and wildfire smoke, because we obviously get a lot of that in the Reno Sierra Front region, but can you talk about kind of the the quality of that smoke and the 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 composition of it compared to wildfire smoke and the health impacts of the two? Sure. Um, we get prescribed fire um, every year. Uh, it's an important tool that uh, land managers use to um, reduce the um, potential spread of wildfires and the severity of those wildfires. Um, and we recognize that's an important tool as well. Um, in Washoe County, we do permit them um, to, to do prescribed burning. Um, and over the years, we do see smoke impacts from prescribed fires, um, but they are very short-lived. Um, they are usually less than um, you know, the unhealthy for sensitive groups air quality index range. Um, so it usually tops out in the moderate range, but people closer to the fires might see more smoke impacts. Um, but yeah, the composition of the smoke is similar to wildfire, um, but it doesn't have um, homes burning, it doesn't have automobile, it doesn't have all the man-made synthetic materials that a wildfire smoke potentially could have. Um, uh, you know, if they're a pile burning, um, it could be a lot drier um, uh, biomass um, and, you know, wet wood is uh, emits a lot more air pollution than dry wood. So um, there's a lot of different aspects to prescribed fire, um, but generally it is meant to reduce wildfire um, from spreading and destroying homes and lives. Um, it, it can be a temporary nuisance for air quality concerns, um, but it's short-lived and um, is generally um, um, understood by the public that these are necessary to um, uh, make sure that wildfires don't uh, destroy our communities. I'll, I'll kind of add on to that, that with prescribed fire, uh, nearly all of them get a spot weather forecast to help make a go, no go decision on doing them and, they, and the plans almost always factor in nearby communities, you know, like, okay, you know, on this fire near Mammoth, we don't want a Northeast wind because that'll smoke out the town. And so they'll, they'll wait for those weather conditions to appear that are optimal for keeping smoke out of the, the community. So that's something that's, that's good. They do take advantage of our weather forecast to help make those plans. Great question. Um, so um, Ann Hobbs with the Placer County had um, just been dropped, but she's back on. Um, Ann, do you have anything to add for our Placer County um, attendees? Um, no, I, I think, um, Brendan, I heard some of your, your comments. I think that you, you covered the, you know, the general air quality information. I think for wildfire smoke, the best information out there is the wildfire um, map, the fire and smoke map that you can get to from the air now. That is um, that map is also going under a uh, slight revision. It's going to become more robust, and we should see that sometime mid-month when it gets re-released um, by the US EPA. But I would say most air districts um, definitely push the public to use that map because it's got great information on it between wildfire information, some prescribed fire information, um, smoke plume information, and the differences in the, uh, the three different types, the two monitors, the temporary permanent monitors, and then the purple air sensors. There is one thing I will add, even though you can see purple air sensor information on that map, not all purple air sensors are on that map. The indoor ones are not on that map, and some of the outdoor ones are not on that map if they haven't been able to meet the QA, QC procedures the US EPA has put on. And then there's the people that take their indoor monitor mm -hmm. and they put it outdoors or vice versa, but yeah. they don't go into their personal settings to, to change that. I know last year we saw, um, it was horrible air quality, but one sensor was always in the green. We figured out somebody put it in their house. <laughs> so their house was good, but it gave a miscons, you know, a little bit of misinformation there. So that's, that's the best information out there. And then in Placer County, um, we do have a permanent air monitor in the Tahoe City area for both uh, PM 2.5 particles and for ozone. So that's actually really good um, for the uh, Tahoe area.
Thanks, Ann. Appreciate that. Um, so there's no more questions. And I just really want to thank Brendan, Chris, and Ann for coming on and, and educating everybody about this important topic. Thank um, you. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm going to stop the poll. Um, this is anonymous again. Um, I will not be sharing this information. Um, thank you to everybody for attending. And be sure to check out our next uh, Living with Fire series. Um, it is going to be next month, and it's going to be about um, hardening your home. And so we're going to have a Q&A with an expert about hardening your home. Thank you, everybody. Have a great one. I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording. Good job, guys, that was awesome.